Holly Crawford, Director of the County of San Diego Office of Emergency Services. I'm glad you're here today watching this video. It's my job to make sure that the region and residents are ready for disasters. So your role in providing safe shelter for man-made and natural disasters is critical. The Office of Emergency Services is responsible for coordinating the county's response in an emergency situation. And as you know, we live in a very big county. This video is the first of three training videos that will show shelter workers how to care for individuals who need additional assistance. Each shelter resident is unique and their needs and abilities can vary greatly. These three videos will demonstrate proper procedures when caring for residents with physical, cognitive, and emotional disabilities. The techniques and responses you will see today employ best practices for people who need additional assistance. This first video will show how to properly assist and meet the needs of evacuees who have physical disabilities. A disaster that requires evacuation is frightening for everyone, but knowing how to provide proper assistance in a variety of situations means creating a safe environment for all shelter residents. The County of San Diego Office of Emergency Services works with several local agencies to provide shelter along with employees from the 18 cities within San Diego County. The American Red Cross is one of the lead agencies. The American Red Cross's mission is to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. Each year, the Red Cross responds to nearly 70,000 natural and man-made disasters in the U.S., ranging from fires to hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, hazardous material spills, transportation accidents, and explosions. They provide food and shelter in emergencies, assist members of our armed forces and their families, as well as teach life-saving skills, and more. Volunteers are at the heart of the American Red Cross and a huge part of its success. People from local communities are relied upon to help carry out humanitarian work. Local volunteers make up 95% of the workforce that makes it possible for the Red Cross to respond to disasters and save lives. In an emergency, there is no way to predict who will arrive at a shelter the precise nature of their needs, or the challenges the shelter staff may face. This training video is meant to raise awareness and address some of the needs and considerations important to assisting shelter residents with physical disabilities. It's a starting point. A disaster has occurred. Shelters are opening to assist people who have suddenly become displaced. Your job is to greet them, to welcome them, and as quickly as possible, make them feel comfortable, assess their needs, and direct them to the appropriate people and services at the shelter or elsewhere if necessary. There are many kinds of physical disabilities. An individual's limbs can be affected, which may require the aid of canes, wheelchairs, or prosthetics. Or one may have a reduction or loss of senses, such as sight, hearing, or speech. Motor function may be affected, resulting in movement that is restricted or imprecise. Some disabilities are from chronic health conditions, such as respiratory disorders, which require use of equipment or devices. And it's important to note that people with physical disabilities may or may not have other disabilities. It's best not to make any assumptions, but to communicate with the person directly to determine their needs. In this video, you will learn about people with physical disabilities and different situations where you can assist them. You'll learn about registration and intake, mobility aids, walkers, wheelchairs, lifting and safety, transferring a resident, people who are blind and have low vision, people who are deaf and hard of hearing, eating at a shelter, dressing, and personal hygiene.
Hi, I'm Mike. Hey, guys. It all begins with respect and equality. Treat everyone as you hope they would treat you. Every newcomer to a shelter must be registered. This is critical for many reasons. Shelter workers need to know who people are. They need to know how many people are in the shelter to make sure that there are adequate supplies and meals. Registration is the first place and time that shelter workers have the opportunity to evaluate incoming residents. There's an English and Spanish registration form. Uh, do you speak English? Habla no. Español? Habla Español? Sí. Hold on one second. Our community is diverse, and some shelter residents may not speak English. You may need to look for someone who is bilingual to assist you in a language you don't speak. If a translator is unavailable on site, you may request a translator through the shelter manager, who will contact the care and shelter branch coordinator from the emergency operations center. Remember, there may be a slight delay in the translator arriving. Make every effort to communicate with everyone. It's important that the evacuee you are registering understands your questions. Also, be sure to write legibly. The first step is to make your initial observation using the registration intake form. The questions on this form will help you to identify and obtain needed services and supplies for shelter residents. Keep in mind that just because a person has a disability doesn't mean that they need immediate medical assistance. Through your observations, you'll need to assess if the evacuee or a family member appear to be in need of immediate medical attention. Do they appear too overwhelmed or agitated to complete registration? Or is he or she a threat to themselves or others? I what you kind of help do you give here? I see it. all you're asking me to do, fill out form, fill out form, fill out form. If the answer is yes, stop the registration process. At this observation, the first thing you must do is notify a medical services staff member or a mental health worker on site. I need it all. I need it all right now. Great. Um, this is our nurse. She can help you with the medical portion of it. Can you tell me what the problem is? If the situation is critical or the situation requires support, immediately contact the shelter manager. Come on, let's get the show on the road. Look, I don't want any more talk here. I want action. Now, now, now. Your shelter manager is there to support and address your concerns. Shelter managers have a lot of situations to handle, and you can help by properly evaluating and prioritizing before you contact him or her. If the situation is critical, or the situation requires support that is not available, call 911. This is only for life-threatening conditions, and the shelter manager must be notified, preferably before calling 911. When this is not possible, make sure you notify the shelter manager immediately after the call is made. If the evacuee demonstrates or tells you that they may need additional help in the shelter, acknowledge their need and offer assistance. This may include contacting a medical services worker. Every person is different. Your training manual contains a more comprehensive look at the registration process and how you as a shelter worker can best do your job in these first moments. Ask the shelter manager if you are unsure about your assessment. A person with one disability may have other disabilities, but they may not. You must be carefully observant and considerate. For example, don't assume that a person who is blind is also deaf, or that they are unable to communicate with you. Be smart, be proactive, be respectful. Overall, it's important to understand that no matter what, if the situation exceeds your level of training or comfort at any time, seek assistance from the medical services staff at the shelter. Each individual with a physical disability has special medical needs. But physically, there's all types. There's a quadriplegic, there's a paraplegics, there's a amputation, amputees, yeah, amputees um, people that came back from the uh, war, 
also uh, wounded warriors uh, who have severe brain injuries and, and there's all kinds of uh, physical disabilities. Well, probably the most important thing for a shelter worker to know is probably just that it's just a regular person that's coming in and has some special needs. And what the shelter worker probably could do is provide, like, start listening, see what those needs are, and assess the situation. And then the shelter worker could probably make sure that the individual with disabilities had access to get to places that they, you know, like to a bathroom or, or to a, a, a food area, communal area, or, um, or, or to bed even, you know, make sure they had access to get in the bed. You know, don't be afraid to say you don't know. Don't be afraid you don't know how to do it. And don't be afraid of the situation of the person. It's just a regular person, just like anyone else, you know, and they have maybe some extra needs. Don't be afraid to have some humor, you know, even in a, in a horrible situation, you know. Um, and, you know, and just don't be afraid. There are many causes of mobility needs, advanced age, physical injuries such as herniated discs, fractured or broken bones, physical conditions such as obesity, late stages of pregnancy and emphysema, neurological conditions like Parkinson's disease or the impacts of a past stroke, and the absence of mobility devices such as missing limbs, missing prosthetics or mobility aids left behind. You know, if people say, what's wrong with you? I'll say, well, I'm not sure. And then I'll go, no, you know, I have cerebral palsy. I think using humor is a great way to say, you know, kind of neutralize the situation. But education, it's all about educating people so they understand, you know. Some of the needs I might need at a disaster shelter are like assistance with getting food so I don't spill it all over. Or if the bed is too low, I might need help getting up and down from the bed. There are people that treat me differently. When, like when I go shopping, they'll talk to my sister or my nieces and not talk to me. Like I'll give them go to pay and they'll tell my sister like it's eleven dollars and they're like, we're not paying, she's paying. So people would just start seeing me and not knowing if I understand or can communicate back. So yeah, it's can be challenging at times. Some things would worry me about going to a disaster shelter. It just, you know, not knowing what was going on, not knowing how long I would be there, not knowing if, it, you know, I could have enough medication or other accommodations I need. A shelter worker can make me feel more comfortable by, first of all, just talking to me like they talk to everyone else and making me feel comfortable there and, you know, saying this is a safe place and that they're here to help me and asking me what my needs are and when I need help they're here to help me as best I can, and just being, you know, supportive. When working with and caring for people with mobility needs, remember several things as you help settle them into the shelter. Their reduced physical abilities may make it difficult or impossible for some residents to negotiate or use some parts of the shelter make sure they are close to and can reach the services they need. For example, if necessary, take the time to walk someone who is blind around the shelter, identifying exactly where each service is located. Once they are oriented, they may be self-sufficient. Find out what help you can provide that will assist in their ability to navigate independently during their stay at the shelter. 
They may have a limited ability to sit, stand, or walk, bend, or carry objects. They may move slowly and have reduced coordination and endurance. They may require more time and effort to speak or communicate. You'll need to be familiar with the various kinds of assistive technology devices used by people with physical disabilities. You'll need to know what they do, why and how they are used, and how you can help people who rely on them. Independent mobility is important for residents as well as shelter personnel. Canes and crutches will be briefly presented, while walkers and wheelchairs will be covered in more detail as they are used more commonly and have some specific instructions for safe use. People requiring only a little support or assistance when walking or standing are likely to use a cane. Those with more serious disabilities or injuries may require a walker or wheelchair. Crutches tend to be more a temporary measure than a cane, walker, or wheelchair. If someone is new to using crutches, you can help by making sure they are adjusted properly to their height and arm length. Elbows should be slightly bent and the crutch tops should not be pressed into the armpits. Walkers are four-legged assistive devices that provide more stability than a cane or crutches. They're more commonly used for major physical impairments, such as a chronic or severe knee or hip impairment, or when a person has significant balance issues. A person who uses a walker should never be hurried. Walkers come in a variety of types. The standard walker has four legs and is used by picking it up and moving it forward, one step at a time. Two-wheeled walkers allow the user to push the walker. The back legs prevent the walker from rolling while the user is stepping forward. Four-wheeled walkers roll freely and are used by people who don't need to lean on the walker for balance. Walkers are adjustable in height. Have the individual stand with their arms at their side. Elbows should be slightly bent. Adjust the walker legs to the correct height, making sure the walker legs are level to the ground. To help someone use a walker, have him or her grip the top of the walker with both hands for support and then move it one step ahead. Then the individual will take a step, starting off with the injured leg and move forward into the frame of the walker, not behind it. The heel of their foot should touch the ground first and then flatten as their weight shifts forward. Next, lift the uninjured leg, toes first, stepping forward, and repeat. They should not step all the way into the front bar of the walker. Use smaller steps when turning. To assist someone with sitting while they're using a walker, have the individual back up to the chair or bed until their legs touch. They should then reach back to feel the seat before sitting. To assist them in getting up, have them push up, bracing their body's weight with one hand on the seat while grasping the walker's grip with the other hand for balance and support. If they don't have balance issues, they may put both hands on the arms of the chair or the side of the cot to push up. Make sure that the walker's rubber tips are in contact with the floor so that it doesn't slide when the individual is trying to stand. Make sure the person doesn't try to pull themselves up from the chair or cot with the walker. If you notice that someone is using their walker incorrectly, kindly offer to assist them in using it the right way to avoid injury. Wheelchairs are used when walking is impossible or impractical. Even more than walkers, wheelchairs come in great diversity, most notably in size. A good fit is critical because the amount of time spent in it may be considerable. When sitting down, the user's hips should have one to two inches of extra space on each side of the seat. Seat depth tends to be 16 to 18 inches. Shorter is better, 
as deeper depth may hamper leg circulation. Manual wheelchairs are propelled by the user moving the wheels with his or her arms and hands. Manual wheelchairs should never be used for more than temporary transportation purposes without a qualified assessment and physician's prescription. Safe and appropriately equipped chairs have working wheel locks and usable footrests. Some wheelchairs have armrests that can be lifted out to help transfer people out of the chair and leg rests that can be elevated. Sometimes they are equipped with a seat belt. If so, use it. To sit in or get up from a wheelchair, follow these steps. Always lock the wheels before the resident sits or stands. Push the wheel lever forward so that it engages the tire, prohibiting movement. If the chair has foot or leg rests that fold up or swing away, make sure they are up and out before sitting or standing. After both of these actions are complete, have the resident back up carefully to the wheelchair until their legs touch the edge of the seat. They should reach back to find the seat and then slowly lower into the chair. To stand, ensure the brakes are locked and leg rests are out of the way. And then have the resident use the chair arms or a mobility device for support to push or pull up into a standing position. Working in a shelter can mean doing many different jobs during your shift. It's likely to include performing physically demanding work, such as lifting or moving heavy boxes, kitchen or other supplies, oxygen tanks or folded wheelchairs, and residents for transport. It's critical that you maintain good form and safe practice to avoid hurting yourself while trying to help others. The first thing to remember is good posture. It's the simplest way to prevent a pulled muscle or strained back. When performing physical work, keep your head up and straight forward with your chin level. Relax your knees so they don't lock. Keep your stomach and buttock muscles tight, chest held high, shoulders back and aligned over the hips. Don't twist your body in ways it was never meant to twist. Don't lift if you can achieve the same result by pushing or pulling. Use any appropriate assistive devices that are available. Situations where you do not want to attempt a lift are when something or someone is too large or too heavy. Odd-shaped items also may be too much to manage without help. Here are five good principles of body mechanics. One, when lifting, use a broad base of support. Place your feet at least 12 inches apart, with one foot slightly in front of the other. 2. Keep the object being lifted close to your body to lessen the strain on your lower back. 3. Keep your upper body straight and upright. Let your leg muscles do the work. 4. Lift smoothly without jerking. While lifting, tighten stomach and buttock muscles. Five. Do not lift and twist at the same time. Keep your feet in the direction where the object or person is being moved. Pivot your feet instead of twisting your upper body. Oftentimes you will find that a person who is unable to stand on his or her own will need help getting into and out of a wheelchair on and off of a toilet or shower chair. Transporting a resident takes communication and planning. Always be sure to first ask the person how you can help them. Many times the individual can talk you through the process of transferring them and let you know the way that you can give them the best assistance. It's important to understand the process that is generally followed in order to transfer someone from a wheelchair to a cot and the opposite, a cot to a wheelchair, or from a wheelchair to a chair, and back. 
Be sure to explain what you're planning to do as it's happening. Um, what do you need me to do? So the first thing I'd like you to do is I'd like to have you roll over onto your side. I'm going to assist you, okay? Then what we're going to do is you're going to come up to a sitting position. Then we're going to stand up, turn around, and sit down here in the wheelchair. Okay, just a pivot chair? Yeah, I'll show you how to do it. To help someone transfer from a cot to a wheelchair, position the wheelchair next to the cot, facing the foot of the cot, bringing the chair as close as possible to reduce the distance of the transfer. Lock the brakes and raise the footrests. If the person is lying down, you may first need to help them to sit up. Bend your knees, keeping your back as straight as possible. Place one hand under his or her shoulder and the other supporting their thigh on the opposite side. Count to three. Carefully swing their legs over the side of the cot and assist in lifting their shoulders into a sitting position. Instruct the person to scoot forward until their feet are firmly on the ground. After sitting up, put on their shoes while they rest. The next step is to help them stand. Place your left foot beside the right foot of the seated resident and with your right foot set a foot apart and slightly behind, bend your knees. Standing directly in front of the resident, place your arms around their back, under their arms. Ask them to put one arm around your shoulder and place their other hand on the edge of the cot to help push off. One, two, three. Count to three. Once standing, shuffle your feet so that the resident now has his or her back close to the edge of the seat of the locked wheelchair. With the resident reaching back to use the wheelchair as support, slowly lower them into the chair. Remember to bend your knees while keeping your back straight. To return to a cot from a wheelchair, use the same procedure in reverse. Remember to talk to the resident about the transfer. Always make sure the wheelchair brakes are locked and the footrests are raised. Remember to keep your back straight when you bend. All of the safety precautions apply when transferring someone from a chair to a wheelchair. There may be a time where you will use a gate belt to assist with the transfer. A gate belt is a device used to assist in lifting a person from one position to another, or while helping people who have balance problems to walk. To transfer a person from a chair to a wheelchair using a gate belt, follow these steps. Wrap the gate belt around the individual's waist, and like a seat belt, buckle it securely together. Make sure the belt is applied tightly enough to prevent it from riding up or down on the individual's body, but loose enough for you to grasp it firmly and comfortably. Lean forward and grasp the gate belt on both sides around the individual's waist. If the individual has a weak side, make sure his or her stronger side is facing the destination, for example, toward the wheelchair or toilet. Widen the position of your feet. Place your left foot forward and to the outside of the individual's right foot. Your right foot should be placed back a little to help in shifting your weight as you lift the individual. Slightly bend your knees and lean your body in. Instruct the individual to get ready to push from the arm that's on the chair as you lift the person to a standing position. Count to three. Yeah. One, One, two, two three. three and then lift the person as you pivot with them to the chair, keeping your back straight. Some shelter residents will have other types of physical disabilities, such as having low vision or are blind and loss of hearing or being deaf. As a shelter worker, you will need to pay attention to their needs and ensure they are made to feel safe, comfortable, and cared for. When assisting a person who is blind or has low vision, introduce yourself and offer a tour to help them learn the shelter's layout. Hi. My name is Carla. What is your name? My name is Lee. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Uh, would you like a tour around the shelter? Oh, yes, please. All right, great. Yeah. So. Be sure to speak directly to the individual. Introduce yourself without raising your voice or shouting. After you have met them, 
Use their name so they know you're speaking to them. If they have a service animal, don't pet or touch the animal. Ask if they need assistance first and wait for them to accept before assisting them. When guiding someone who is holding your elbow, keep your elbow close to your body. All right, two more steps, and we're gonna reach over here the door threshold, so we're just gonna go a little slow. Okay. There we go, okay. and now we're in the hallway. Alert the resident of any upcoming changes in elevation, such as steps, a door threshold, or a corner. Also be aware of any potential obstacles, such as a low door or furniture extending into a pathway. Try to choose the clearest, safest, easiest route, and also be as specific as possible. If you and the shelter resident need to walk in a single file, let the person know as you offer your arm behind you. Hi. Hi. Hi, my name's Eileen. I have your dinner for oh, you. Oh, thank yes. you. Yes. We've got chicken at 12 o'clock, mashed potatoes at 4, and your vegetables at 8. And then your utensils are right over here to your... At mealtime, talk about what's being served, naming every item. Identify the locations of food on a plate using a clock analogy, such as the corn and green beans are at 8 o'clock, chicken is at 12, and the mashed potatoes are at 4 o'clock. Well, if any shelter worker meets anyone in a shelter with a disability, the best thing to do is come in and engage and really communicate. Um, there are multiple disabilities out there. Mine's visually impaired, so if someone comes to me, best thing to know is I would love to get to understand their voice, to get a feel for their voice so I know who they are. So the more they talk to me, the better I understand their voice and I could actually call them, I could hear them when they're coming uh, near me, and that's great. In the shelter, I'm sure I'm gonna encounter many obstacles, move cots, uh, people probably leaving bags on the floor. So it would be very helpful to have a walking cane with me to feel those obstacles on the floor, to feel what's around me, um, so I could open a clear path. A shelter worker, the best thing they could actually do for me is keep me informed of what's happening, really show me what my surrounding area is, and tell me what's around me. Could you please show me where this is? Can you assist me where this is? Could you please tell me what's going on? The, most, the more information I have about my surroundings and where I'm at and what's happening, the more comfortable I will be. I definitely would prefer a cot that's up against the wall in a corner just because of logistics. I would be able to feel that, oh, this is the wall where my cot is. Oh, this is the corner where my cot wall is. So I know how to get to that place all the time. Um, any shelter worker come up to a person that's visually impaired and ask them, how much can you see? Everyone that has a visually impairment is fine with that. Um, some folks have a little bit more sight than others. Um, the most important question that I would ask is, how can I help you? Tell me how I can assist you so you could be or feel safer and know your surroundings in this area. And the visually impaired person will let you know exactly what they need, how they would like to be helped, and how you could guide them from point A to point B. Hearing loss and deafness affect people in different ways. Many of the elderly may have a degree of hearing loss from mild to profound. Use the words deaf with signers and hard of hearing or hearing loss with others who don't use sign language. It's important as a shelter worker that you assess how the shelter staff can help provide adequate services for individuals with communication needs. Sir, thank you so much for waiting. Um, we just need you to fill out these uh, forms real quick and I can help you do that. Sir? I just, we just need to fill out the form. Can I get your name? Oh. Always have paper and pencil available. Be aware that English may not be their first language and they may not be comfortable with written communication. If needed, you may also request a sign language interpreter or translation services through the shelter manager. Keep in mind that there may be a slight delay in the arrival of those resources. It's important to make every effort to effectively communicate with everyone. Shelter workers who may know some signs 
are not qualified American Sign Language interpreters and should always contact the shelter manager to request an interpreter. You might be able to communicate initially during intake and registration, but you won't have the skills to adequately meet the communication needs of individuals who are deaf. When addressing a person who is hard of hearing or deaf, look directly at the person and gesture to make sure you have their attention. A gentle wave may accomplish this. Be careful about tapping a person on the arm. Some people are sensitive to touch. Speak clearly, normally, and directly to the person, not to their family members or to the interpreters. Be aware that continuing to speak to someone who uses sign language may cause confusion and frustration. Use paper and pencil or wait until the interpreter arrives. Maintain eye contact. Don't shout or exaggerate your lip movements or facial expressions. Don't chew gum, eat, or laugh while talking. Short, simple sentences work best. Smile and remain patient. Don't assume a nod implies understanding. If a misunderstanding persists, use alternative words or other methods of communication. Rely on sign language interpreters to relay information. When leaving the resident, make sure they are in a safe place and explain what you are doing before you leave them. Be sure they understand where the bathrooms and showers are located and what time meals will be served. When a deaf person shows up at a shelter, look them in the eyes, be friendly, smile, show warmth, a welcoming attitude. People often, when they encounter a deaf person, it doesn't matter whether it was me or somebody else, they don't see the person. They see what they consider a disability which means we're deaf, and some people view us as intellectually lesser than or inferior. Sometimes they treat us very condescendingly, and sometimes they don't treat us with respect. It can be, they can be rude, they can be impatient, they can make a lot of assumptions about us as humans, as people, as professionals and what we're capable of accomplishing. And that type of approach can be very offensive. I want to be clear that shelter workers shouldn't assume that deaf and hard of hearing people can read lips, because many of us can't lip read. It's really a myth. So I want them to try and find other ways to, that are more acceptable ways to communicate with us until they have a qualified interpreter show up. We need signs in shelters so that we know where the restrooms are, what time food will be served, the basic information that other people might take for granted. We don't have access to that information. If people are trying to talk to us and we don't understand, communication breaks down really quickly. They may be fearful to say what their needs are or may be in shock. So I think it's important to be gentle and sensitive with them. And if they don't respond, if they just say, uh-huh, yeah, and they just nod their heads, maybe you could say, you know, they're not understanding. Maybe I need to try harder to communicate with them. And if they're not responding, if you don't assume that if they just nod their head, that that, that means they really truly understand you, you have to go a little bit further than that to make sure that they're understanding. Maybe ask some questions. Are you understanding me? Um, you shouldn't just make assumptions. For example, with Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana, one deaf man apparently showed up at a shelter, and he was the only deaf person at, the whole, at that shelter, and he was, felt really uncomfortable, and he didn't feel comfortable telling them that he was deaf, and he didn't know what to do, he was scared. He was also diabetic, and he didn't inform the workers there that he was diabetic. And he didn't realize that the food would be provided would be free. He thought he would have to pay for food, and he didn't have any money with him. So he ended up refusing to go to get food, and he went into a diabetic coma. They didn't realize until later on what had actually happened. When he finally woke up in the hospital and explained what had happened, that he was afraid to touch the food because the lack of communication, lack of signage, 
maybe a sign could have said, please take food, food is free. You know, it's for everybody here. He didn't know that. So that kind of thing happens often with deaf people. There's misunderstandings, lack of communication, fear, fear of associating with people there because nobody there can sign. Um, it's very important that shelter workers be sensitive to recognize our needs and know that writing back and forth is not always acceptable because a lot of deaf people may not have skill, English skills that are not comfortable with their English skills. If American Sign Language is their first language, writing back and forth really is not successful. If they feel that you're afraid of them or don't know what to do or don't know how to handle them, it'll affect their mood, it'll affect how they are receiving or feeling, feeling welcome to the shelter. So I think treating us with respect and kindness and compassion, but not pity. I think that makes a big difference. Providing regular, healthy meals is often a critical part of a shelter's mission and purpose. Doing so presents its own challenges and considerations, particularly for people with physical disabilities. Your first task is to identify residents who might need assistance, which can range from simply helping them get their food at mealtimes to actually assisting them with eating. Keep in mind that some people may have dietary restrictions that you may need to be aware of before assisting them with their food. Some examples include diabetes, food allergies, or being hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic. Hi, I'm Lexi. I work Hi, here at the shelter. Hey, how are you? Hi, thank you. I can see you're having some trouble. Can I, I help you with that? Please do. Great. Thank you so much. Oh. Be discreet, respectful, and polite. Encourage residents to do things as independently as possible, but remember to ask if they need help and what you can do to assist them. Here are some things to think about when helping residents at mealtime. Offer the person a chance to wash their hands or use a hand sanitizer before the meal. Help them with a napkin if necessary. Make sure foods and liquids are no hotter than 85 to 90 degrees. The same goes for plates and bowls. Use your judgment to determine the temperature of the liquids and foods. For example, if it's a fresh cup of coffee or hot tea, give the liquid 5 to 10 minutes to cool down before giving the drink to the person. This goes for food as well. If you've just made a fresh plate, make sure the food is no longer steaming before serving. And you can easily determine if the plate is too hot when you're handling it. Just make sure you let the shelter resident know that it's too hot for them to touch when you place it in front of them. If a person requires a straw to consume liquids, help place the straw in the resident's mouth if needed. They also may need your help holding it in their mouth. Allow the person to intake the liquid as desired. However, watch to make sure they're not trying to drink it all at one time as this can cause a choking hazard. If the person drinks from a cup but requires your assistance, use slow and steady movements. Remove the cup frequently from the person's mouth to allow time for swallowing. Use spill-proof cups if they're easier or more convenient for the resident. If a person requires a drink while lying down, you'll need to raise and support their head while holding the cup or straw to their mouth. Some residents will need direct help with consuming their food. It might be as simple as placing it on the table or cutting portions into bite-sized pieces, or it might involve actually helping to feed them. You will need to ask the shelter resident how you can assist them. If you do need to help them eat, here are some tips. Fill a spoon only two-thirds full with food and then touch it to the person's bottom lip. After they open their mouth, touch the spoon to the tongue so that you know the spoon is entirely inside. The process using forked food is the same. Feed slowly, allowing time between bites for chewing and swallowing. Offer liquids after several swallows of solid food. At the end of the meal, offer water to rinse their mouth. Some physical disabilities and conditions can make eating more difficult. Choking, gagging, or coughing may be concerns. Some of the ways to facilitate easier swallowing are emphasizing soft foods or placing foods toward the back of the mouth or the unaffected side. 
make sure that all the food was swallowed and encouraged the resident to remain in an upright position for at least 30 minutes after a meal. Some shelter residents with physical disabilities may need help dressing and undressing. This can be a somewhat delicate and personal situation. Remember to be respectful, compassionate, and discreet at all times. As much as possible, residents should be afforded privacy when changing clothes. This might be provided by using set-aside rooms, restrooms, or by simply hanging a blanket or sheet around the residence area when necessary. How are you doing? Doing You're, well. You ready for breakfast? Yes. Let's get you, uh, let's get you changed, right. okay? I'm going to have you sit up. For safety reasons, residents needing assistance when dressing or undressing should remain seated or lying down as much as possible. It's always important to ask the person how best to assist them first. They will normally know how you can help them to do this. However, in general, it's important to know the steps needed to assist someone. When helping a person to undress, start with the upper garments first and work your way down. If a shirt needs to be pulled over the head, take it off starting with the strongest or most mobile side first. Because oftentimes they can help you move the clothing with that arm or shoulder. Again, make sure the resident is sitting down when removing lower garments or items like socks and shoes. When helping a person to dress, begin with upper garments while they're seated. Start with the weak side first. Underwear should come next, followed by socks. Socks can be difficult to put on and require extra assistance. The lower outer garment, pants or a skirt, should be put on part way while the resident is still seated, followed by shoes. Help the resident to stand and then pull up the lower outer garment the rest of the way. Dressing or undressing a person lying down presents different challenges. Make sure the resident is covered by a blanket or a sheet for privacy. Ask the resident to partially participate by raising their hips or rolling to one side or the other so that lower garments can be pulled on or off. Personal hygiene is very important in a shelter, both for individuals and for the group as a whole. It promotes health and comfort for all concerned. People with physical disabilities may need assistance to maintain their desired or appropriate levels of hygiene and grooming. As a shelter worker, you may be able to help. First, try to identify those who might need assistance and ask if they desire it. Such assistance can range from brushing teeth and combing hair to using the toilet. Most shelters are likely to have limited bathing or showering facilities, but assistance here is also a possibility. Some basic rules to remember. Be gentle and patient in tasks like brushing hair or teeth. Go slow and regularly ask if everything's okay. Be cognizant of and respect cultural differences. If a shower is available, make sure that it can be safely used by people with physical disabilities. It should have grab bars and a non-skid surface. If a shower chair is needed, make sure that it's stable and capable of supporting sufficient weight. Most shower chairs sold today have a capacity of 300 pounds. Allow for privacy, but be nearby to assist if required. Toileting is a naturally personal subject. It's normal for you and the shelter resident to be reluctant to mention it. But if you think it's a matter of consideration, ask. Do so discreetly and respectfully. Often the person will need only limited assistance. For example, they might require help just getting into the restroom or reaching the toilet tissue. In some cases, a modified toilet may be necessary. These range from raised plastic toilet seats that attach to existing porcelain toilets to raised seats with arms used to lower and lift the body, and all-in-one adjustable portable toilets that can be used almost anywhere. Let your shelter manager know if you identify any equipment needs that are not immediately available for residents. I was injured in 1977 when I was 19 from a, an automobile accident. I was um, 
was thrown from a car uh, traveling on the freeway. So, you know, I was injured basically at the, you know, the very beginning of my adult life. I learned how to uh, become an adult with a disability by watching what other people were doing, learning how to obtain services on my own. There are gonna be needs that people with disabilities have understanding how you know how to make those components like this the cots and bathrooms and showers accessible but also understanding that people with disabilities are going to need medications while they're in the uh, while they're in the shelter uh, understanding that they may uh, have service animals that will need to be with them when they're in the shelter understanding that they may need personal care assistance and making sure that people would be allowed to come into the shelter and provide that type of assistance I think it would be, you know, a willingness for the shelter worker to work with somebody and, and it might be an awkward situation, for example, using a restroom or getting in and out of shower or frankly just, you know, transferring on and off uh, onto, on and off a cot, you know, into a wheelchair walker or something like that. So, you know, being in a, you know, being willing to sort of be in an awkward situation, frankly, would go a long ways and being able to sort of, you know, laugh or just kind of have a a little bit less, you know, than a tense kind of atmosphere. It's already going to, you know, be a difficult situation. So being able to sort of roll with the punches, if you will, and take whatever's coming in stride would be really valuable from the uh, shelter worker's perspective. The most critical components for any successful shelter are the people who make them work. The professionals and staff shoulder an enormous responsibility for caring for and meeting the needs of all people at the shelter. This video showed you how to register and intake evacuees, how to make an educated observation, and what to do if further assistance is needed. It's important to remember that if a situation exceeds your level of training or comfort, you should seek assistance from the shelter manager or the medical services staff at the shelter. You also learned how to help with mobility aids, such as canes, crutches, walkers, and wheelchairs. You learned how to prevent injury when lifting, how to transfer residents, how to help those who are blind or have low vision, how to help people who are deaf or hard of hearing, how to assist residents with eating, and finally, how to assist residents with dressing and hygiene. In the event of an actual emergency, you'll need to make the best possible choices and take the most appropriate actions based upon your training, the expertise of professional shelter staff, and common sense. Working in a shelter is a powerful, rewarding experience, and I know you'll do everything you can to make every resident comfortable while supporting his or her independence. Thank you for your time and willingness to serve our community.